All right, so the other day on TikTok or Instagram somewhere, I saw a comment or a, a post about router direction around a workpiece. There was a lot of comments and it seemed like a lot of people are confused. So let me just clarify this with a different approach. So the common consensus is that you're going, you should go counterclockwise around a workpiece, right? Just like that. That makes sense, right? Counterclockwise, well, what if you're cutting on the inside of a hole, right? What if we're putting a round over on in the inside? Well, it's not counterclockwise anymore, is it? This looks clockwise. However, in reality, you're going the same direction. Let me explain. So here's a workpiece, and let's say we're gonna put a chamfer on the outside of this corner. We're gonna start going around this counterclockwise. We're going counterclockwise. We come around here, we're going on the inside. Now it appears as though we're going clockwise, but in reality, I haven't changed actual direction. I'm still moving in this direction around the workpiece. So rather than thinking in terms of clockwise or counterclockwise, think of it in terms of cutting into, or the router bit cutting into the work. And that's pretty easy to, to clarify as well. So here I've got a router table and then handheld. Of course, if this is handheld, the, the router bit is in that orientation and it's opposite in a router table, right? Let's take a look at this router bit. How do we know which way this is spinning? How do we know which way that is spinning? They're spinning in the same direction. It's just that one's upside down and one's right side up. So an easy way to know which way the router bit is spinning is take your right hand, hold it out, your thumb, that represents the router bit. Your fingers represent the direction of router bit travel or spin. So with the handheld, I can hold my thumb like this. That's the router bit. Fingers are the direction of the cut. And you can look at the carbide and say, yeah, that makes sense that that router bit would be spinning that in that direction to cut into the work. A lot of times they even have a, an arrow. I don't guess this one does, but sometimes they have arrows on a uh, router bit direction. Same thing with the router table. Hold my right hand up, thumb rep represents the router bit. My fingers are the direction of the router bit spinning. And so you can see that the carbide would be cutting into the work. I really didn't represent it correctly with a handheld. My right thumb would be pointing down. So here, yes, we would be going like that. But in reality, we're cutting, the router bit is cutting into the work. This edge would be the same as this edge. So I'd be going this direction here. I'd also be going that direction here. So this is actually clockwise on the inside, counterclockwise on the outside. But don't think of it in terms of that. Think of it, think of it in terms of the router bit cutting into the work. Make sense? Yeah. Hey, check it out. So I've got my large port cable router here and I am going to route some sauce hinges. So I need the router bit to be centered with the collar, right? And they're usually close enough for most work, but sometimes you need them to be closer. So what you can do, I've added this called a centering cone, right? One inch collar on here. And this plate is a little bit special. Well, not really that special, but let me just show you what I did to it. So this is the original style. Eh, broken. Anyway, the original style has a countersunk hole with these machine um, screws to hold that in place. Well, they just put it in place in one spot as that conical shape tightens down. It just secures it in one spot. You, you can't move it around to make sure that the collar is centered with the router bit. But with this type of a hole called a counter bore, and I just made those utilizing one of these spade bits at the drill press, made that a counter bore, and then I took some bolts and ground them really flat, and I made the slot a little bit deeper so that these the heads of these machine screws are really shallow and they'll fit in that counter bore. And now I can bring this down 
this plate is kind of loose. Let me show you that. See how the plate moves just a little bit? So I can bring that down onto that centering cone. And now it's centered. I mean, it, it'll twist around this way, but it's basically centered on that. Let me make sure that's down far enough. There we go, I like that better. But now it's centered, and so now I can tighten that up, ensuring that the shaft and the collar are concentric to each other. Makes sense, yeah? So if you don't have a sled for your router and or your shaper, if you don't have a shaper, you can just back up some narrow pieces. These are just backups to prevent tear out. I can effectively run these copes. Now, all I have to do is uh, do that again, turn them around. It's very effective if you only have a few pieces to run. Almost a little loose, actually. Hmm, not sure why. Oh, I know why. That was my sample piece. <laughs> that one didn't count. There we go. There we go. Perfect. Huh. Yeah, this is my uh, sample that I made it. Uh, I cut it a little bit big. But anyway, so yeah, in a pinch, you can gang them together like that, back them up, no tear out, very effective. Lots of ways to do things, yeah? So sometimes I wonder why it takes me so long to make something so simple. This dust shroud at the router table is really effective for capturing the dust. Here I'm routing the ends of all these handles Using the fence to do this doesn't always work that great, and I ended up adding a piece of plexiglass, a clear plexiglass or Lexan to the top of this. You can see I can put this in different positions. Works really well. I wanted to show you these cup magnets, or these cups, four magnets, I should say. I cut a little notch in them. You can see that little notch. And then when I do a counter bore for it, I'll cut a notch in the wood. This way I can drop the cup in, I'll screw it in place. Then when I add the magnet, if for whatever reason I don't like the strength of the magnet or I need to do something else with it, I can easily pry the magnet back out, remove the cup, and I still have the magnet. So it's a good alternative to using uh, glue, which I typically use epoxy, but sometimes I like these cups. And this dude lives down here with the wrench and the spanner I added a magnet to, and boom, everything in its place and a place for everything. Recently I had a project where I needed to cut a few different sized holes. I wanted them super clean and so I used a router and here's an easy way to do it. I made the jig with some scrap melamine and I started with a bigger size using pocket holes to assemble the components. Working from larger to smaller I can cut the jig down and keep on cutting more holes. It's a super fast and effective way to do this and you can kind of see in the photo I'm doing two layers at once just to save time and improve accuracy. Or at least reduce the time to measure, yeah? I am constantly cutting hundreds of parts for my docks that I make and sell, and these in particular, they get a 3 8 round over and it'll blow out. So here's my solution. Now I need to add, at first glance, it looks like I could just route a long board and then slice it up, but that would create more cuts because one side of this particular piece has a two and a quarter degree angle, so it wouldn't be as easy to cut as it is to route hundreds of these pieces. 
nice and clean, yeah? I refinished this table recently. I made this back in 2011, and I ended up taking it to the Texas Woodworking Festival. Had a lot of fun showing it, and received a lot of questions there, and earlier when I had posted it on Instagram, about how this was made. So I thought I would share that. This is uh, basically a starburst pattern. That's how I started. Cutting all these pieces, there's 10 sections, but in reality, there's 20 pieces because each one of these sections is two pieces uh, opened up like a you know book match. So two, four, six, all the way around, 20 separate pieces. And I made that as a veneer. And then before I connected all those sections, I cut this part out and you probably can't see that. There's a, this is where the spider is. This is done as a uh, marquetry motif. And so this was cut along these uh, lines. There was none of the spider web was in yet, but I had laid out where these lines would be. Cut this part out, did this as a marquetry pattern, hooked it all back together. And then I had a starburst pattern ready to be glued to the substrate. I ended up leaving each section slightly long so that I could cut off the end and then bring that piece of veneer down so the grain would all index all the way around the perimeter, right? Then I probably adhered the edge and then went ahead and glued down the starburst pattern. Once that was down, I cut all these arcs. And the way I did that, of course it was all laid out and I made a simple jig and if I remember right it was just this piece of quarter inch and then I realized that well how am I going to clamp that down so I ended up adding this these wings you can see some sandpaper there to really hold it down better gription right and with this in place and laid out I could Put this precisely where it went, where it goes, right there. And then I used a 3 8 collar probably. Yeah, it looks like a 3 8 collar, a 1 16th bit, and I created these grooves. And here's something interesting. When I first started, when I first laid this out, uh, probably on some MDF or something, I realized as this tapers to a point, if these were all the same radius, this these short ones ended up looking straight. It was really odd. So what I ended up doing is making this short one a three inch radius. You see that? And then if I bring this over here, you can see just how different. Let me see, lay that out, okay. You can see just how different that is. So this is a three inch, four, five, six, seven, eight, and a nine inch radius, all different radiuses to eliminate that illusion. So once I had all the curves in place, they just came to a, an area here. This must have all been laid out somehow, which is really challenging because it's hard to write on this. Maybe I used a white pencil lid or something. Anyway, once all the curve curved areas of the spider web we're in, I used a straight edge and a router to create these 1 16th straight um, parts of the spider web to, uh, to complete that. Once all the spider web was complete, I sanded everything flush, but you know, not perfect. I wanted to leave a little material. You never want to sand too much until your final pass. And then I turned my attention on this chamfer. And what I did is take a router with the bearing like a rabbit bit with a bearing, cut a small rabbit all the way around the perimeter, and then added a piece of holly that was square but long. Uh, I think there's a couple of seams in this. And the way I held that in place is I took another section of particle board that was roughly the same size, I just cut it really quick and rough, and cut a groove in from the, from the edge all the way around the perimeter. And then I put that underneath and probably anchored it underneath with the groove facing down. And then that groove allowed me to allow a clamp similar to this to engage in that groove and hold this piece of holly right at the angle that I needed 
and I had multiple clamps, tons of clamps all the way around the perimeter to hold that in place. It worked really well. Once it dried, I was able to flush it up and then chamfer this with a router. Here you can see that holly would have been the path of the router bit, right? And I probably put these lines here to know that I was approaching the edge. And so I would just stop right at these intersections. So something interesting to note is that when I refinished it, I realized how much darker the top was because it got sanded down to raw wood. And you may or may not know, but dark woods tend to lighten with age and light woods tend to darken over time. So eventually this will patina to a lighter tone to match the pedestal and the legs because it was all, you know, created at the same time. It's the same, it's the same uh, veneer out of the same flitch. So anyway, the legs were made out of maple and then I veneered over them and then exposed by chamfering the corners. And that just adds a little something and also um, will minimize uh, impact, right? Without a, a sharp corner. And then down at the bottom, again, I added some, some holly there. I believe that was face grain, probably attached with dowels and epoxy and just to add a little flare. And also uh, one of the main objectives of, of adding that since it's face grain, it won't wick up moisture like it would if it was just the bottom of the leg. There's a close-up of Morticia. So yeah, something like this spider web, accurate detail cuts can be done with a router. So here's a bit of a unique setup that I use on my large router. First of all, I want to lock the plunge mechanism open or unlocked. So I'll just use a squeeze clamp. Of course, the router needs held securely, so I've clamped one of these Jorgensen wooden hand screws in place. And I have this block that will go around the switch. There's sandpaper on each side of that block for better gription. That'll hold it securely in place. These are the pieces I need to route a shallow cavity in. And you're probably wondering why not just use a Forstner bit at the drill press. The main reason is, well, I used to do that, but plywood's vary in thickness, and so utilizing a drill press meant I would drill different depths. And I decided to go outside just to reduce the mess, but now I can quickly create this little cavity, and it's always going to be the exact same depth. So just like that, I've got about uh, 100 of these. Well, not about, about 100 of those smaller ones. Then I'd say maybe 22 of these other ones. Same thing with that one. And this one, I don't have the uh, the cam lock, but they're big enough so it's easy to hold. But yeah, very effective. I have these laser engraved hundreds at a time and I can easily route the perfect depth to accommodate them. It's no secret that the router and a router table is a perfect way to cut exact round dowels. Here I'm cutting some out of plastic, but the process for wood would be the same. I'm using a 3 8 bit, which is the radius, which will create a 3 quarter inch round dowel. Perfect results every time. These were used as simple spacers. I often get asked, what is the purpose of a shaper if you have a router table? Well, a shaper can accommodate much larger bits and cutters, and the shaft size can be changed from, I believe, half inch all the way up to inch and a quarter on this particular machine. So to make this backup piece, I like just taking a wide board, a lot safer, right? Clamp that down, run it through. It'll cut that profile, which is a reverse of that because that's the coping bit. Once you have that cut, then of course you can just take that to the table saw, rip it down. This width is just something that fits with this clamp. So you can see as that engages in that. And this material, you could even use some of your same material. It's the same thickness. I like using MDF. If it's thicker, it doesn't matter. If it 
that difference will stick up on top. They need to be flush on the bottom, which they will be since you're running it the same time you're doing the coats. And this distance of this piece is just relative to my particular clamps, right? So it goes just like that. That's engaged there. Flip them around to run the other side. Just like that, yeah? The large mass of a shaper means reduced vibration. You can make much larger cuts and even much larger than this. This is actually a small shaper. And here I'm just doing a back cut or a relief cut to create about a quarter inch wide portion of this panel that can then be inserted perfectly into the rails and styles. So again, here at the shaper, this bit, flush cut bit, is really not that large. I mean, they make much larger. I believe this is about an inch and an eighth diameter or about 28 to 30 millimeters. This would be too big, in my opinion, for a router table. But with the shaper, which is really just a large router, we can get beautiful, clean, perfect, and accurate cuts. These are blanks for my zero clearance inserts. They're made of Baltic birch with Formica that's adhered with epoxy on both sides. I have this two-part jig with all these little notches, nooks, and crannies. And the turret has four settings in this particular case, and I'll use all four of those. So with the first pass, I create this shallowest depth number one, and I go all the, all the way across so it cuts out all of that material. Then I utilize this little spacer, and that prevents the second cut from going in that particular notch. Again, I can move the turret to the second setting and make the cuts. This is so awesome and works amazingly well. So that second cut made this particular depth here at the ends and, of course, all the way across. Then I add three more stop blocks, move the turret, and easily create two deeper and accurate cavities. This first little spacer, I kept losing it, so I painted it white. That didn't work so well, so I added a magnet to it. <laughs> move the turret and one final cut to create the radiuses on the two ends. Beautiful, fast, and accurate. These take about two and a half minutes to create all those cuts. So we decided to add this QR code, right? Check it out and show you on my old phone. You see, you just go to your camera or if you have a QR scanner and boom, just like that. <laughs> How cool is that? There's all my product, my website. Boom, I love it. Here there must have been a crack in the wood that I didn't notice, simple repair. All right, so the repair in this particular case will be a rabbit, a partial rabbit. I'm using this bearing or bushing to create about a 3 16 rabbit, which is just slightly more than this little tear out. You'll notice a piece of wood that has a notch at the end. That's just a scrap clamped in place. And that's just to back up the router bit so it doesn't blow out and provides a spot for the router bearing to start. You'll notice that I'm making all reverse cuts. That way, the right side of that groove or that rabbit that I'm making won't blow out. Add a little bit of glue and some tape and you end up with a practically invisible or at least inconspicuous repair. If you've watched my YouTube video on making drawer boxes, you know that I'm not a big fan of a groove for a drawer bottom. I like it nailed on directly on the bottom or if you want a cleaner look, you can cut a rabbit to create that same strength because you can glue it in solid. I'll typically make multiple passes, reverse cuts or climb cuts to reduce or eliminate tear out and then do one final cut in the correct direction. Yeah, and after using a belt sander or an edge sander to create all the radiuses on the four corners, I can use a sandpaper block to touch things up and get a perfect fit. I absolutely love this process of using a large trammel to create these big radiuses. Of course, I do it outside because it can make a mess. 
At my old work, we would do tons of these for reception counters, which this is actually for a reception counter. And typically it would be made of plastic laminate or sometimes solid surface, but the process was the same. Again, notice my direction of cut. I'm doing multiple passes that are reverse cuts or climb cuts. This will reduce or eliminate chipping. Once I've done all of those cuts for the entire circumference that I'm cutting, then I'll make one final pass in the correct direction. The forward cut pulls the bit in slightly and produces a cleaner cut. Notice I'm stopping short at the end. That way I don't create a radius where that countertop needs to be straight. And yeah, there are a lot of special jigs or fixtures to create these trammels, special trammels with measurements and everything, but I like to just keep it simple. This is just a scrap piece of melamine. And to anchor the point, I just use a screw. That way I know it's not going to come loose. Super effective, and I get really good results. I have another YouTube video on creating smooth interior cuts with a belt sander. You can check that out. Once all the edges are smooth, I add the profile. Here is an excellent way to create an exact location for a finger pull. This was done on a substrate, so I added solid wood and then veneered over it. But you can see the two blocks will create a perfect place to back up the cut and also register where the router bearing will ride. So these funky little tables are actually speaker enclosures, but I thought, hey, let's make them like tables in case, you know, one of these days your speakers could go away, right? And the intention was to make the a portion of the panel or a tenon come through the tabletop or the illusion of that you can see the end grain there here's a little bit of a close-up now of course you couldn't do this with solid wood but since it's veneer I could do what I want and here's where I utilize the finger pulls and boom <laughs> hidden drawer so on the drawer guides, I removed the little rubber detent so that the guide would open and close freely, but yet the magnets would pull it in at the last split second. And the drawer front has 15 degree angles and the carcass has the 15 degree angle, corresponding angle with, of course, hidden magnets. <laughs> kind of cool, yeah? Lots of features and always created with the incredible router. Want to keep your veneer from shifting when it's in a vacuum bag? Simply add a stop block and then route it off later. I am always amazed at the incredible versatility and usefulness of a router. Here I have a pair of doors and I created this vase and these stems and the little leaves. That was all created by hand utilizing a technique called marquetry, right? I needed to connect two of the stems and a partial leaf from one panel to the next, and for that, I utilize this cool little Porter Cable plunge router. Of course, the stems are tapered, but I was able to make one pass and then move the trammel slightly. Here I've added a simple rabbet around the perimeter of this top, then I can glue in a contrasting species of wood and then chamfer that. That creates a little bit of a decorative element. This will also reduce the impact area of that top corner. Here's a finished shot of the routered inlay work in the styles, and it blends perfectly with a hand-cut marquetry. And that is about it. I certainly hope that this video gave you some ideas for unleashing the potential of your router. Have fun in the workshop and stay safe. And as always, thanks a ton for watching.